It's a scientific fact that the hormones of stress downregulate genes and create disease, long-term effects. Human beings, because of the size of the neocortex, we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. We can think about our problems and turn on those chemicals. That means then our thoughts could make us sick. So if it's possible that our thoughts could make us sick, is it possible then our thoughts could make us well? The answer is absolutely yes. Hey everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. Our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is a New York Times best-selling author and one of the most sought-after speakers in the world. He's lectured and given advanced workshops in more than 30 countries across five continents, all with the aim of helping people better understand and unlock the power of their mind. His expertise is the intersection of the fields of neuroscience, epigenetics, and quantum physics, and he's partnered with other scientists across multiple disciplines to perform extensive research on the effects of meditation, using advanced technologies such as epigenetic testing, brain mapping with EEGs, and gas discharge visualization technology. Through his work, he is endeavoring to help advance both the scientific community and the public at large's understanding of mind-derived health optimization, a topic he covered extensively in his groundbreaking book, You Are the Placebo. His teaching has had such a profound impact on the way that people perceive a wide range of brain-related topics around mindfulness and well-being that he's a faculty member at the Quantum University in Hawaii, the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies in New York, and the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He's also an invited chair of the research committee at Life University in Atlanta, as well as a corporate consultant where he delivers his lectures and workshops for businesses. So please, help me in welcoming the man who has appeared in such films as Heal, People vs. the State of Illusion, and Unleashing Creativity, the author of the recent book, Becoming Supernatural, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Thanks for being here. So diving into your world and how you perceive the sense of self and the way that you marry science to the way that we form memories, the way that we live in a perpetual state of reliving our past and things like that is really, really incredible. And I want to dive into the whole notion of you sort of being a habitual construct. Like what, what is that? What is the habit of you? Well, a habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. The habit is when you've done, th done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it better than your mind. So if you think about it, people wake up in the morning, uh, they begin to think about their problems. Those problems are circuits of memories in the brain. Each one of those memories are connected to people, and things at certain times and places. And if the brain is a record of the past, the moment they start their day, they're already thinking in the past. Each one of those memories has an emotion. Emotions are the end product of past experiences. So the moment they recall those memories of their problems, they all of a sudden feel unhappy, they feel sad, they feel pain. Now, how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So the person's entire state of being when they start their day is in the past. So what does that mean? The familiar past will sooner or later be predictable future. So if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny and you can't think greater than how you feel or feelings have become the means of thinking, by very definition of emotions, you're thinking in the past. And for the most part, you're going to keep creating the same life. So then people grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their texts, they check their emails, they check Facebook, they take a picture of their feet. They post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they do Instagram, uh, they check the news, and now they feel really connected to everything that's known in their life. And then they go through a series of routine behaviors. They get out of bed on the same side, they go to the toilet, they get a cup of coffee, they take a shower, they get dressed, they drive to work the same way, they do the same things, they see the same people, they push the same emotional buttons, and that becomes the routine, and it becomes like a program. So now they've lost their free will to a program, and there's no unseen hand doing it to them. So when it comes time to change, the re redundancy of that cycle becomes a subconscious program. So now 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old 
is a memorized set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions that function like a computer program. So then a person can say with their 5% of their conscious mind, I want to be healthy, I want to be happy, I want to be free. But the body is on a whole different program. So then how do you begin to make those changes? Well, you have to get beyond the analytical mind because what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And that's where meditation comes in because you can teach people through practice how to change their brain waves, slow them down. And when they do that properly, they do enter the operating system where they can begin to make some really important changes. So um, most people then wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis. You know, they wait for loss, uh, some tragedy to make up their mind to change. And my message is why wait? And, and you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. And I think right now the cool thing is that people are waking up. That's really interesting, and where I found the, um, the deepest hooks into how powerful this can be for somebody is when you talk about trauma, and you've talked about how people experience a traumatic event, but they then basically rehearse it, and mm -hmm. how that then has this knock-on effect. So what is that? Why do people find it so hard to get past trauma? Well, <clears throat> the, the stronger the emotional reaction you have to some experience in your life, the higher the emotional quotient, the more you pay attention to the cause. And the moment the brain puts all of its attention on the cause, it takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created from very highly um, uh, emotional experiences. So what happens then is that people think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so, when you have an emotional reaction to someone or something, most people think that they can't control their emotional reaction. Well, it turns out if you allow that emotional reaction, it's called a refractory period, to last for hours or days, that's called a mood. I say to someone, hey, well, what's up? You say, I'm in a mood. Well, why are you in a mood? Well, I had this thing happen to me five days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. If you keep that same emotional reaction going on for weeks or months, that's called temperament. Why is he so bitter? I don't know, let's ask him. Why is he so bitter? Why are you bitter? Well, I had this thing happen to me nine months ago. And if you keep that same emotional reaction going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And so learning how to shorten your refractory period of emotional reactions is really where the, where the work starts. So then people, when they have an event, what they do is they keep recalling the event because the the emotions of stress hormones, the survival emotions, are saying pay attention to what happened because you want to be prepared if it happens again. Turns out most people spend 70% of their life living in survival and living in stress, so they're, they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience, and they're literally, out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, they're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear. And they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times, body has a panic attack without you. You, you can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. So then you say to the person, why are you this way? And they'll say, I am this way because of this event that happened to me 15 or 20 years ago. And what that means from a biological standpoint is that they haven't been able to change since that event. So then the emotions from the experience tend to give the body and the brain a rush of energy. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So the body's believing. It's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And so then when those emotions influence certain thoughts, and they do, and then those thoughts create the same emotions, and those same emotions influence the same thoughts, 
Now the entire person's uh, state of being is in the past. So then the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before, period. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. It, there's going to be some why, uncertainty. Why does it feel so uncomfortable? Is it because of the, the, the neurons that fire together, wire together, so I've, there's like an easiness to that loop? Just because literally, and you've talked very eloquently about this, the way that the neurons connect in the brain, how rapidly, I've seen you show footage of how yeah. rapidly those connections happen, which is pretty incredible. Um, is, is that what makes it so discomforting for people? I think, that, I think that the bigger thing is that we, we keep firing and wiring those circuits, they become more hardwired. So you have a thought and then the program runs. But it's the emotion that follows the thought. If you have a, if you have a fearful thought, you're going to feel anxiety. The moment you feel anxiety, your brain's checking in with your body and saying, yeah, you're pretty anxious. So then you start thinking more corresponding thoughts equal to how you feel. Well, the redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind. So now, when it comes time to change, a person steps into that river of change and they make a different choice and all of a sudden, they don't, they, they, they don't feel the same way. So the body says, well, you've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, you're you're going to just stop feel, suffering and stop feeling guilty and stop feeling shameful and you're not going to complain or blame or make excuses or feel sorry for yourself. Well, <laughs> the body's in the unknown. So the body says, I want to return back to familiar ter territory. So the body starts influencing the mind and it says, start tomorrow. You're too much like your mother. You'll never change. This isn't going to work for you. This doesn't feel right. Uh, and so if you respond to that thought as if it's true, that same thought will lead to the same choice, which will lead to the same behavior, which will create the same experience, which will produce the same emotion.